All right, good morning, everybody. How are you today? Good? Hope you all had a good night's sleep, albeit an hour shorter than we all hoped we would get. Um, and have had some time to... Who needs sleep, right? We'll see who shows up at 10.15 today. Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of like an extra benefit of the fact that we had breakfast 45 minutes early. If anybody comes in at 9.30, it's like, yeah, that's, they're here just on time. Um, so I, there was a lot of information that we kind of threw at you yesterday, and hopefully you were able to process some of it. And um, maybe you have some questions about it now, and that's what this session's really about. It's an opportunity to ask any questions you have about um, anything you heard about yesterday. Uh, we, got a, we got several responses on the form, and we'll go to those. But of course, if anything comes up just in conversation now, we're going to keep, uh, keep running notes, and we want to just try and get everybody to a place of um, comfort by the end of today's. In particular, to organize any uh, requests for general topics or specific questions, and we'll prioritize based on that and what was submitted online and some things we've heard last night. Anything at all. Anything at all. There's curricular things, technological things. Well, we can uh, start out with one of my favorite questions from the form. OK. What's the catch? What's the catch? Oh. What's the catch? Hmm. <laughs> so there's no catch. There really isn't. Is <laughs> the answer that you're all expecting, but it's also the true answer. That we, there really is no catch here. Like, we, we're not requiring you to use the curriculum. We don't require you to do it exactly the way that we recommend you do it. Um, I, if there was a catch, it would be we'd like to know how your students are doing if you're using the curriculum, because if we're providing a curriculum that is not working, we want to be able to fix it so that it can work. But we're not really trying to push an agenda here. We just want to create an experience that we've seen work for many students here and has been transformative in our own department. Um, yeah, and for us, this has been a, an opportunity timing-wise. Like the AP Principles curriculum has been under development now for five, six plus years, and it's finally coming to fruition. And wonderfully, uh, all of the materials have now had a history of being open courseware, so to speak, since 2007. And as a couple of us were discussing last night, we've had a tradition since then of making many student-facing materials available. But it wasn't really until AP CSP was coming to fruition that it occurred to us that what we've never really focused on is the teacher side and actually explaining some of the things that we do and trying to provide a look behind the curtain and providing actual textual and electronic resources for teachers in particular. So for us, participating in the CSP initiative with some of our friends elsewhere is really just a manifestation of that. So indeed, no catch. Can I answer that? Of course. Uh-oh, there's a catch. <laughs> I get that part right. We're all laughing. It's funny, kind of. But there's, you know, because there's a long legacy of Microsoft and education. So why in the world would Microsoft, you know, support and amplify the work of the CS50 team and, and David in particular? And so I get everything from educators hanging up the phone when I go to call them about their application to the workshop, I can't start out by saying this is Nacho from Microsoft, click, they'll hang up. I have to say I'm calling on behalf of the Harvard CS50 team to let you know we received your application. <laughs> My name is Nacho, I'm on the Microsoft side of things. And then, and then yeah. people will hang, right? So we're supporting. Oh. Yeah. It, and what's what you said. Oh. <laughs> so, so I do get that question a lot. What's the catch for Microsoft? So really, um, you know, we have a new CEO, Satya Nadella. He's been with us for two years, and he has given us a very, very clear directive, and that is to improve everybody's life on the planet, to make everybody more productive and, and better at everything they do, including educators. And in the case of Microsoft, we have these capillaries all across the globe where we have boots on the ground and we have employees who are helping people do wonderful things. And when it comes to computer science education, we have a choice. We can either spin something up using proprietary tools and proprietary curriculum and we can go into that space or we can look around and we can see who really is doing the most excellent work and then support those efforts. So that's really what led us to mm -hmm. Professor Malin <laughs> and the CS50 team. And we took a look at not just the curriculum and what was happening at Harvard and now at Yale. We looked at that blueprint for the world. And that's how we talk about CS50 at the company. We look at a learning community. So really what David's accomplished is he's figured out how to build a true learning community globally online and that's something that's empowering not just for computer science educators but for educators of any discipline and that's what's so exciting for Microsoft so we win by you know 
by getting to support his efforts. We're going to get this curriculum out, not overnight, but we will get it out globally to every corner of, of the earth and empower educators and empower students to do this. We love CS50 because every single language that's taught in CS50 is something that we use every day at Microsoft. So Windows was built on C. And so it's you know a fabulous match, and um, we believe in everything that you're doing. Oh, well, thank yeah. you. I stepped this close only because that mic's not working, and oh. I needed you to get picked up by my mic. So. <laughs> oh, really? oh. I was trying to stare you down here. We love this guy. We love this guy. It doesn't get any better. You know, I get to work with these with these educators, and we get to you know where the stories are coming. You know, are starting to crop up, and and are coming from across the globe. And so really, that's what we can do is we can just apply. You're already everything is excellent. What we can do is say, hey, let's, let's resource you to take it everywhere. Mm. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. Glad to. Oh. <laughs> 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 um, thank you. I have two questions. One is just like a simple one about grading. I, I think Nacho said something about um, you offer this class as pass fail. Like you're the first one that could do that. Or like we that. do at the college. This is a philosophical um, thing for me. I would just as soon do away with all grades in CS50 and really focus on uh, on the notion of pass fail, albeit with a slightly higher bar. So yes, at the college we allow students uh, <laughs> begrudgingly to take it for a letter grade still, as is the culture, but also sat on sat satisfactory on satisfactory. The only difference for which at Harvard semantically is pass fails cutoff is a D minus and sat on sat is C minus or higher for satisfactory work, which feels a little more compelling than getting a D minus and calling it a pass. Um, and this has been a philosophical change a few years ago for us. In fact, the course uh, for many years was offered pass fail at Harvard, this very low bar. And at least here in a bunch of places, there's just not much of a culture um, among this campus, among these types of students of sort of be willingly taking courses pass fail, even though there's still a huge proportion of students on campus for whom there is this fear factor of taking computer science and a lot of STEM fields, especially if they have no prior background in it. And so one of the messages we wanted to send along the lines of accessibility some years ago was you should absolutely not fear failure, even if in your own mind failure is a B or worse, um, but rather you should feel quite comfortable, especially at college when you're finally exiting high school and you've had a fairly structured schedule for some 18 years of your life to explore unfamiliar waters. And so for us, um, encouraging students to take the course pass fail or some equivalent has been actually a huge message for us. And it's gone up from two to 3% years ago to 13% in more recent years. Another great question just came in. That wasn't it, though. <laughs> uh, Perfect timing. Um, what are people doing to teach, encourage, and require pseudocoding? So at the beginning of the year when we started, the kids, you know, we did the lessons on pseudocode, also coming over the to peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you it's know, working. the type of thing, the Mike Smith in the phone book. Um, but the kids kind of didn't really see the purpose originally of pseudocoding. And, um, you know, what we did actually, we had a Skype with Nacho, which was really great. And her professional team explained how that's how it's done in the real world. And, and the kids really took to that. And then they came, they started to work in groups sometimes around a table before they'd get on a computer and work out the pseudocode together. And uh, I also began I, somewhere around that time to do the walkthroughs I mentioned yesterday. And part of the walkthroughs, would also be to make sure everybody together we develop the pseudocode at times, you know, depending on the difficulty of the problem set. So it's an important part of it, and I think the kids have begun to appreciate the importance of it this year. And in office hours, too, we all commonly encourage students, even though they have their laptop right there and they're working on the P set, to actually take um, out a piece of paper and not so much do flow charts and the like, um, but like, actually, let's come up closer together just for the camera's sake. Um, <laughs> Uh, not so much uh, do the tr more traditional flow charts, but just like draw boxes of memory, which actually maps very nicely to C, so that with each step through your program, you actually cross out what variable, uh, what value is in some variable, and then repeat. And in fact, we didn't show it, um, we haven't shown it in much detail in this group, but the IDE that you saw last night, some of you, um, has a built-in debugger, quite like you would see in Eclipse or in NetBeans or Visual Studio or other tools, that even though it's a little more arcane, it will allow students to step through visually in a way that's much more accessible than like the command line GDB program, if you're familiar with that. So that too can help along these lines. I think another thing that can help is when you take CS50 yourself through edX, you are going to, for your own success, you're going to need to pseudocode and you're going to need to sketch everything out. And Zamila even says that. You know, she says, pseudocode everything, draw everything. So I can say, having taken the course, that I have two notebooks full of drawings, I have index cards, all of these things. So you know what? Take pictures of your work and then showcase your work with your students, and then that they will do what you do. 
I think the other important thing is that pseudocode is not um, a language itself. It's not an exact science, and there are lots of different ways to pseudocode. And it's not just the what we saw lined up there. I think that it is things like flowcharts. It is things like even discussions or d diagrams or drawings. Um, there's many different ways in which one can pseudocode, and there's not one right way to do it. Um, I think that letting students explore the, what makes them the most comfortable um, is and the it, right entry point. And invariably, that's the kind of code that's going to be on the, the exam, as you might have glimpsed in the purple packet, yeah. some generic well, pseudocode. Ask, that, that format we think is set? Uh, probably not safe to assume that just <laughs> yet <laughs> until the summer. But, but that might be one thing to use, is use that as your pseudocoding format so the kids yeah. It's set enough that, it, that yeah. it will start to appear in the modules now that, I, now that they, there is a more standard pseudocode language for the CS Principles exam. Will, there will be examples that map that to C to Scratch um, as and I well. I think ultimately showing students different formats, whether it's even if you don't use Scratch, showing them some Scratch blocks or showing them the more textual format there, the left arrow instead of an equal sign, just so that they don't get tripped up by the clutter. So one of the questions that we got asked here, as well as uh, actually that came up last night, are you asking too much for students? Um, and this came up in our uh, circle, circular discussion the other, uh, just yesterday. Um, so the course has indeed been positioned as we, we intend the more rigorous of the AP CSP offerings. Um, as to whether it's too much, I think it's really a function of time. Um, most uh, high school classrooms have the luxury of, or the benefit of, or the challenge of um, some 30 plus weeks. But I know in some cases there's uh, shorter time frames, whether it's 18 weeks or fewer. Um, and so I can say we go through the course's curriculum in just 13 or so weeks here, which is absolutely ambitious and tough, especially for working adults who are taking it through Harvard's Extension School. And so I think the best ingredient is that, that ability to stretch things out over time and to use two weeks or one and a half for every one of our one weeks or three weeks. And in fact, we're nearing the point, I think, uh, in the course here at Harvard, where it is actually a better educational experience to be taking this course online or a bit more asynchronously so that you're not constrained to the sort of traditional college schedule of classes on Monday through Friday or Monday and Wednesday in our case, and then a piece at due every single week. I think being able to play with the schedule is the key ingredient to success. So I dare say high schools are better positioned than we might be with this more confined schedule to tackle the course's material. So we shall see. Uh, other questions. Uh, how does the grading workflow work? So we will see that right after this session in some detail with Doug and hands on. And in fact, in the pipeline, as we'll, you'll likely soon hear from us electronically, um, we're considering a number of new tools that we'll be making available not only to our own teaching staff here on campus, but to any teachers who might like to use it for collecting work, for grading work, as we said yesterday, for automating some detection of uh, academic dishonesty, if that's of interest and such. Uh, let's see, what can we, so let me toss that question back to folks in the room. What can we provide to you in terms of other materials and tools, whether it's curricular content, whether it's technological content, how can we be helpful if thoughts come to mind? Or what problems do you feel you might otherwise leave here not having solved? I mean, I have an idea, if it's sure. okay. Yes. So one of the things that I would love is more ideas, like more snippets of code. Okay. More, I think the kids really enjoyed looking at code, and they learn a lot from looking at code. And early on, early on when we started the curriculum, there were you know some very simple hello world and Fahrenheit and fairly straightforward problems, but there weren't a lot of examples mm -hmm. of code for them to look at. And you know I used many of the examples from your video, but I felt that I started to create a few of my own. And being busy creating the curriculum, or whatever, it was always a bit of a struggle to come up with something that was meaningful and sure. made sense and demonstrated integer overflow or floating point imprecision. And so. Um, I just think more examples of code okay. are really, really helpful. So. That's good timing, because one of the new features that'll come out in the IDE in the next few weeks is the ability to uh, provide students with a hyperlink that will directly open a file that you or we provide in the IDE so that they can immediately save it and start compiling mm -hmm. and playing. So we'll do more of that, for sure. So um, okay. one of the things that I've not been able to find, which might be out there, are some smaller exercises that don't lead to code, but just towards asking them to come up with an algorithm. Mm -hmm. Just do it like a whole series of, you know, they could have five of these for homework, not that they're mm -hmm. too taxing, but just practice, practice, practice. OK. Good, that's help. OK, helpful. Christian? Um, in line with the code examples, maybe it would be useful to have examples on uh, how code applies to applications that uh, kids use daily. Okay. For example, you know, I don't know, the Instagram, or Snapchat, or WhatsApp, whatever is popular, um, and then break it down as if, if 
uh, put a filter, anything, uh, then the picture will look like this. Say if I do that, then anything, uh, and you can go to yeah. pseudocode, you can do it very simple, but that sort of looks like, oh, it applies to what I do all day, or it, it applies to what I do day. So. It really comes organically with the P sets, like in the P set 4, when we're talking about images, P set 5, it's something like whenever you're texting and you've got that underlying, it's like, how did it know that it underlined? And that's exactly what we say in the lecture. So we get the attention of the students, like, this is how we do it. How fast is, like, this underline was instant. How does it do that? So now, like, in the later P sets, they're all applicable, all linked to a daily things that they're having. That's something that's beautiful. It's more Snapchat. Yeah. I can imagine send it, transmitting the videos that way, so they expire seven <laughs> seconds after they watch them. So you've got to focus. <laughs> yeah. I like the idea of the samples code, but would it be nice to have, this is a sample code, this is what the pseudo code looks like, the plot is code. OK. You know, that way they can say, oh, that's what the pseudo code, oh, yeah. you know, they can compare. OK. That's helpful. Or maybe like, and sorry to jump in, but maybe like if we could do like diagrams to pseudocode to code, like that process, I think is something that my students at least really struggle with because they're like, they think code first and then they like try to translate into pseudocode to like meet my requirements when really I want them to learn the thought process. And move yeah. From, it's weird in my brain eventually narrowing. Good. That's helpful. We'll see what we can do, especially even within the environment to toggle between those kinds of views. Other requests, yeah. Um, same line of thinking about the sample code. If you could do it in a way where it's indexed, like, you know, like a, a, with just small examples, um, like for example, you know, working with letters and loops. Loop, like okay. just have like loops, several bunch of different 50. examples and what they do, rather than like five pages of one program. Okay. Because it, like, I know with my own experience, I'm, I'm working on the um, on the. CS50 class right now, mm -hmm. you know, I'll spend like an hour looking through like five books and videos just trying to find like the example okay. that I need, you know what I mean? And if there was just like one place that was just like a dictionary of... So uh, just you know, for the code examples you're saying? Organized by category, you know, okay. like working with floats and just had like, you know, maybe two or three lines of code and what they do. Okay. You know what I mean? Because it's just hard to... It's so time consuming to find exactly what you're looking for. And do you imagine you would present these or you would have students work on them a la worksheets in class or? Well, I mean, something for them to refer to, okay. like a reference almost. Yeah. So if, um, or even like with the problem sets, if there was like a, a little packet of, you know, okay. three pages of sample code and not exactly what's in there, sure. in their problem that they're working on, but similar things. So they can kind of pull from it. Okay, that's helpful. It. Are you familiar with Study 50? I yeah, I, yeah. I did look at that. There's some um, stuff there, yeah. but do you think like more examples on in that order or in that way that it's categorized will help? Yeah, almost like a like a reference code for each problem set. Um, yeah, and I, smaller I, smaller I, snippets, yeah. not like. Where you have to like um, open up a file and read this whole program, and then open up another file and read this whole program. So it was all in one place. Um. Yeah, I think it'd be great to have things like that that go with the problem sets. And I know sometimes I've spent a lot of time coming up with um, an example, maybe for a warm up, mm -hmm. to you know print out nine numbers in like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine to get them ready for fifteen. Okay. You know, yeah, so that fine. they can think about how to use nested loops, and they'll do it together as a group as a warm up. But the activity will kind of lead them into how to think about the actual problem set. So yeah. when they look at the problem, it's not so foreign to them. It's sure. not the first time they've thought about how do I use nested loops to create this kind of a, an image, you know. Okay. So those would be fabulous, things like that. Because it is time consuming, you know, to find and to right. look for the right yeah. thing and something that makes sense. And it's not such it's a not really stretch that's not. Spent, you know, first yeah. I'll look in, you know, beginner's guide to see. And then I look in this other yeah. book. And then I'm looking at the videos and trying to scan through the videos. I identify exactly, the yeah. Exact yeah. code is. And then look at like a search thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just so many places to try to dig out the exact kind of thing that I'm looking for. Agreed. And this isn't a wheel worth uh, reinventing by everyone. So we'll see if we can factor that out for everyone. Yeah. I just wanted to reiterate something Doug said a little bit ago. When I think we have to be really careful to um, 
and not turn pseudocode into just another language. Like, I don't think we're serving our students if we make pseudocode feel like it has to be something very specific. Because like Doug said, all the brains and all the minds in your classroom actually see that intermediate step differently. And the more we force them into a square hole, then the pseudocode becomes no different than the C code, mm -hmm. I think, to them. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to emphasize that we don't want to roboticize that pseudocoding part because I have students who represent that intermediate thought process differently. And if I made them feel like <laughs> they had to represent it according to the back of that booklet, then we're just, I, I see that as another roadblock to the process. Well, maybe the solution is to provide not just a an example an example of pseudocode, but different types of examples of pseudocode, among which probably should be this canonicalized right. pseudocode, but also no, pseudocode. I was no, no, it was a couple regular. questions. Ago. Oh, okay, okay. It was a couple of questions. But ago. also diagrams or yeah. pseudocode just with different levels of precision mm -hmm. in it. It's true. So how they see the problem and however they can. Right, and even just being able to enumerate it two or three different ways, yeah. just to get or that even, spark generated. Even two totally different approaches. Mm -hmm. The same type of pseudocode, two totally different approaches to solve the problem. Maybe nested loops and some, something that. else to both come up with the same answer. I could see that even for our uh, by our um, phone book example yesterday, where I used yeah. go to effectively instead of a for or a while yeah. concept. Yeah, but, but to have it laid out. To yeah. drive the point home, there's, there's not necessarily, there may be a correct answer, but there's many paths to that. Okay. And I love the idea also of flow charts, just for visual learners, because mm. some schools, yeah. some students really will see things in a different way, right? So having a different way to envision it, I think, is yeah. great. OK, that's helpful. OK. Well, one question here is, what kinds of final projects have been presented by students in the past? Um, this is always like the hardest question, because we see like 600 plus projects at the end of the semester. And I always claim when asked, I love them all equally. <laughs> um, but the most fun for me are the ones that really jump out, or the ones that integrate something that had, no, had not at all been introduced in the class. We had a student who brought his, uh, his electronic piano or keyboard uh, to the CS50 fair a few years ago and tied it in with a USB cable to his computer and actually synthesized music. We had a student who used one of these relatively inexpensive devices, the Leap Motion devices that essentially detects hand movements like the uh, Xbox Connect and connected that to his computer and you could throw balls at the screen by moving your hand like this over his keyboard which was really quite neat. Uh, there's so many projects on campus here at least that solve campus themed projects uh, for like navigating the course catalog or reviews thereof of the courses, uh, for ordering food from like the house dining halls here. Uh, catching shuttle buses and such on campus. And in fact, in the absence of sort of a more creative or individualized uh, project, we would encourage you to encourage students to just look for problems around themselves, whether it's something mom and dad need, or some student group that they're involved in, or helping out their favorite teacher solve some problem or signing up for like uh, the sports events at, in the evenings or something like that, that at least Sort of that's what we do very early on in the semester and encourage students to just keep an eye out for a problem that you think technology could solve. And that's been cool when then students really own that. Find something that bugs them about the way things work in their school or at home or, and try and solve that problem computationally. Another yeah. cool example that I, I recall from not too long ago was a student who was um, a chef or really liked to cook. And um, he was having trouble getting this particular type of mushroom from a from his grocery store, and so he purchased um, whatever you use to grow mushrooms, and <laughs> built this device and had an Arduino connected to it, such that it would regulate uh, temperature and humidity, and it would it would when it when it detected that it was necessary to increase the humidity, it would close a vent. Um, it was it was pretty. He had it was um, like Kinex, like Lego or like a Kinex kit, just to slide the vent and. Right. So even it, it, I mean that's something you wouldn't even expect. It, it doesn't even end up being a, a, a website. It's it's a box. It's a physical device, and it's just running and just checking and you know sp spraying mist into the <laughs> box when it requires moisture. It's 
And I'm a little, I'm a little biased. A project I remember I did once after learning <laughs> programming was uh, I really wanted to go see The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, and they had a website that was just you had to visit every day and be like the first person to wake up to click on the site. So I just wrote a program that essentially hit the site every day, probably for an hour, uh, every hour or so, trying to find tickets. And and sadly, uh, I never got tickets anyway. <laughs> I wasn't fast enough. Um, but things like that, where students might recognize, wow, if I could automate that, just look look what I could accomplish is compelling. So we see such a range. And do invite us, if you, if you would, to your CS50 fairs. We'd love to attend virtually or, or in person. Uh, let's see. This is, so before you yeah. Mind, is there a place where we could show some of those final projects to the students? Inspiration it's, or we, just the short answer, yes. What we've done, we don't have uh, soon. Uh, we have been for the past two plus years collecting not only student source code as part of the final project submission, but we asked them to make a thirty uh, uh, two minute video of them presenting it, either using screen capture or have a friend like film them on their iPhone or whatnot. And so what we have is several, a couple thousand uh, videos of students' final projects. And so we need to go through and curate them, but we'll likely do exactly that uh, to uh, entice students to consider quite a range of oppor opportunities. Yeah. I'd love yeah. to show that on like, the first day of class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll start so to pull that together. We do that actually in the info yeah. session before actually class starts. So they have an idea about what they're about to do. And our projects really vary from like what David was talking about. We used to have a student who built a castle that's all automated that is uh, web integrated as well with video and sensors and everything. And it turned out when he finished, he actually started working in a company that did the same thing, but that castle oh. was a cat house. And it was automated, and it's, it was beautiful. It turned out from like an interest of a small project to make, have like a, a game into a, a real job later on. But on the other side of the spectrum, like uh, PSET 7 and PSET 8 are a great skeleton for building or solving many, many, many problems that students have, whether as chatting yesterday with uh, um, uh, Casey about a project that I've seen here in, 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 in Cambridge last time, for example, uh, a girl was about to get married and she planned her entire wedding for their families going out from one state to another. It was like scheduling system, authentication, putting all the uh, photos and all the things in one place. So the thing that we've seen at great projects is where the problem or interest that they have and they work from there. So that's what we encourage. Like, if you see something that's there, think of how can you use, for example, piece at seven and eight to do it. And that's like we, that's not the first thing that we say, but like later on, like after a week, when we uh, give the project uh, guidelines. Other questions from the crowd, Ramon. We also have the fair videos. Yeah. That's true. We have a lot of interviews. So yeah, the production team films students presenting their actual projects in the context of a lot of music and balloons and other <laughs> students. So we have a few of those, um, one of which we showed uh, yesterday for the, the high school hackathon that we did. So we have similar ones from the fairs, yeah? Margaret, I was hoping you could speak to, I've been piloting this course um, for two years, and so I've had students be um, doing the performance task. And your Arduino story is wonderful, but it's a little, you know, it's hard to get those kinds of examples coming out of the high school classroom. Um, you know, structurally, they, they recommend 15 hours of class time to build this. And what I've found is that the students um, can be paralyzed at first because they really feel pressured to solve this incredibly cool problem. And sometimes coming up with that is, is the hard part. And in, re in reality, you know, the apps take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're really genuine in terms of, of solving a, an intense problem. And the key to that is to make it really interesting to them so then they go and work on a lot of, on, on their own and, and, and that works well sometimes. But you do still end up with a fair amount of mole mashes and soundboards, right? So can you talk about your projects at the high school level and like how you have promoted and, and increased the level of those? Well, to be honest, we're just getting started right now. Okay. So. Um, one of the reasons we started on the web unit um, two weeks ago was because I feel like a lot of the students are, you know, obviously they're very familiar with the internet and their phones and all this, and so to be able to create a project that works in their web browser is very attractive to a lot of them. So, so I'm having them think about it right now. They're going to submit pre-proposals next week, and I'll let you know when it happens, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. 
One question here is, how much effort do you spend grading quiz questions, which are mainly not multiple choices? In the fall semester, we have two quizzes, or uh, which is an understatement for exams, um, about midway through the semester and toward the end of the semester, but before the final project. Um, we've, I have moved away, actually, from doing multiple choice style questions on those over time, um, mostly because I've, even though they're harder for us to grade, I've preferred the free form, where we're really trying to assess qualitatively how much students have mastered the art of thinking through problems and solving them. And so um, we spent, <laughs> to grade 800 exams, we spend five to seven hours with 60 people <laughs> in the room um, to churn through them. Um, but uh, we spend maybe two minutes per page. And all nine years of CS50's quizzes are available on the course's website. And you can look back through those and sample solutions. And we'll start to ex excerpt those so that they're more accessible than in these more monolithic documents. But we would spend about two minutes per page. Each exam has maybe 10 pages. So there's 20 minutes per exam, but spread around multiple people. And one of the tools we alluded to yesterday and might come up again in this morning's grading session is we've been working with some third parties to provide more efficient grading workflows for things like quizzes and things like code. So more to come in the next few months. And among our longer term goals that we've had at CS50 more generally, as well as now with, this, with the AP initiative, is to curate those questions into a topically organized form so that they can easily be drawn from as a question bank. Um, that you could then incorporate into larger quizzes or tests or pop quizzes or more regular assessments like that. So, yeah, I have to put that up. But that's a that's a, a tool we've been working on or thinking about how best to implement for a little while now. I do steal a lot of the questions from your past quizzes mm. from my quizzes, and um, I love them. I just think they're they're fun. You know, they have little subheads. You know, that just kind of keeps it a little bit playful. Yeah. And um, sometimes a little visual. You sometimes know. Sometimes a few cats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, and, and then having the answers available also is just very helpful for grading. So I have a pretty good idea of what I'm looking for when I'm grading. So it's, it's not terrible. But <laughs> One question here is, is there a place for CS50 AP teachers to share re resources and share conversation? Um, absolutely. So there is uh, one tool called CS50 Discuss, which is a community not only of present, but also uh, past teachers who've been partaking. Um, you, there's the CS50 Wiki, which will evolve into another uh, tool that uh, teachers have been suggesting things for over time. Um, and we'll likely roll out other such tools, whether it's Slack or Facebook group, just for teachers and so forth. So we'll keep people apprised of that. And the Discuss Forum contains an archive of all the questions that we've already, that all the threads that have been running so that there might be a question that was asked last year and maybe is relevant to you and so it's searchable and um, hopefully that'll be helpful as well. Will they get invitations to, to, the, to Discuss? Uh, they will. It requires an edX login and in the update that you'll get tomorrow, uh, it'll have information about how to access that community and introduce yourself, et cetera. I, I signed up for the CS50 signed up for uh, HTML, not knowing how much credit I'm going to get as a teacher. Okay. You know, saying uh, teachers need to get PDPs or mm -hmm. CUs. Uh, Nacho just said it might be up to 90 for, for uh, the, the CS50. Fifty. Or I clar to clarify, well, it's ninety hours of work, but I don't know how that translates. Yeah, the CEUs are different for every district. If, if the courses could actually say that, this could be worth. I think you'd see a lot more teachers saying, "Oh, wow, I can get okay. that many PDPs for taking this this class." I think it's going to attract a lot more. Okay, that's teachers. helpful. Especially in, in, in the content area, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you have to get one hundred and fifty total PDPs and they're broken down for your license mm. to, to maintain your licensure. I'm in Massachusetts, I'm sure it's the same around. But okay. it would be great to know how much it's worth to them. Connecticut drop them. You don't have to get them? No? You drop the whole thing. <laughs> okay. okay. That's helpful, though. We'll, we'll do as much as we can for each state for along those lines. Other questions? Yeah, Christian. For students that don't have a computer at home, mm -hmm. but maybe have a smartphone, uh, uh, what tools do you recommend, uh, if any, uh, for them to crack it at home or maybe review some material? Uh, I know I personally use a Kindle sometimes on my phone because you have a lot of free time in, in the bus or whatever, wherever. But are there any other tools outside of a, a computer um, that we could recommend to people? 
I mean, the course is accessible, I think, well accessible by phone in terms of the static content, things like videos and such. All of the textual documents will automatically reformat for mobile. Um, the IDE is, I would say, barely usable, um, or any IDE is probably barely usable on such little screen real estate. We have certainly seen students do it, and we see screenshots popping up, as I've mentioned to a few folks on Facebook, of students posting code that they're working on. And I don't envy that particular workflow. Um, so anything larger, really, whether it's an iPad or Surface or Android tablet or the like um, should work. Everything except Scratch right now is HTML5 based, so it should just work well. Um, so really anything with a slightly larger screen I think is compelling for at least the hands-on part. But with the, the CSOD IDE, even if they don't have something at home, certainly anywhere in school, at a friend's computer, in a computer lab, uh, in a library, cafe, at least they can access their private account. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. A couple of things that came up, they're not really questions, but they were just kind of interesting things that came up, and I don't know if everybody heard <coughs> or just in different discussions. Mm -hmm. One was uh, um, if schools have internships, maybe, um, you know, if a student took CS50 as a junior in high school, they could be like an aide oh. as a senior. Nice. Um, you know, because that way you could, you know, if there's some really great students, um, they could help support the kids in the class. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful get idea. Credit for it and the experience, because you know it seems like, you know, the bigger it gets or whatever, <laughs> you have all these like people helping and stuff, and that might be a really good. That's an interesting contribution to try to make, especially given our precedent of having undergraduate teaching fellows do exactly that. Right. What do you think a typical school or principal or headmaster would need to know or be told or see in order to be comfortable considering giving those students credits? For Somebody instance? here has that system. In, is, in, is well, we have, at the co at actually, the other technical high school would too. Our students, at, at the end of their junior year and their senior year, can go out of fun co op and intern. Okay. And I mean, we it's have a our school yeah, too. Yeah, it's, it's a genius. Already. I could, as a, as a shop instructor, determine that I could have a student do an internal internship, I'd have to go through some formality and, and have a job description and define the parameters of what they would do. But in, in most technical high schools, I think that, that infrastructure is there. OK, that's and helpful. Not technical either. I mean, we're yeah. in a regular yeah. high school, and we have internships. So yeah. right now, there's not a lot. Of, I'm kind of surprised there's not a lot of teachers aides. They go and aid at like the elementary school okay. yeah. and help with like gym classes and stuff. but. Maybe call it teaching fellows, right? Yeah. 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 Put on the high school. Yeah. Teaching I was fellow, a teaching fellow. Make it like a Cool thing. I like this. I'll see if we can add this to the sort of the messaging of the course to make it all the more of interest to students and, and teachers. We have independent studies. Okay. I'm thinking would, would fit as well. Not not internships, but an independent studies. And it would still count for credit? That would mm -hmm. still count for credit. Would yeah. there typically be an expectation by the school that you need to write a, an essay at the end of the experience or anything oh, that definitely. we would facilitate? Yeah. Or? Like ours is a weekly work log. We get like evaluated. Hours. Okay. Uh, yeah. Certainly create some. For, for us, it's very uh, teacher. Okay. Let me just make a note to myself here. The department chair. And there's. Uh, since we're on the topic, yeah. uh, and I spend so much time with the high school internship at Microsoft, there is a decent amount of internships targeted at students this age range where if you have a student that's a TF or a really amazing CS50 student, there are some really exciting opportunities out there, and I think that might be something that would be interesting to surface for you guys as educators, huh. because if you were to send Microsoft a, hey, look at my amazing student email, that's a really strong uh, like applicant for us. OK, so are we lot. doing that? I know we do it in Redmond. Are we doing it at other so Microsoft have, offices now? There's one here in Boston. Okay. It used to be called Foundry. They just changed the name of it. Yes. Yeah. Um, but that's a really cool program, and those guys are amazing. Um, there's also. Well beyond Microsoft, and as I'm sure you guys know, there's lots of startups here in the area. So that might be an interesting resource to start with. I'm not super familiar with the Cambridge area, but I know there's a lot. Can you post the, the former Foundry one, that information in yeah. the in Discuss? 
There's at least one other question here. Uh, what actually happens at a hackathon? What are some of the programming challenges? Um, it is really dependent. We typically focus here at the college on final projects toward the tail end of the semester. Uh, but at Miami Dade, at uh, Browning in New York, and a few other venues, we have focused more on problem sets wherever students are, especially if they are allowed to be out of sync with their fellow classmates. This way, as I think Nacho mentioned yesterday, um, at the high school, for instance, we had this is table for kids working on Mario. This is the table for a game of 15. This is the table for such and such. Really just to facilitate peer support of each other. And I think what's really key isn't so much what the students are working on per se, but just the atmosphere that you create and the fact that people want to be there. They're not just doing it because they have to and because um, there's, there's some other pull to it, whether it is candy or music or lunchtime or whatnot. And I think the more visible you can make these kinds of events, uh, the better within a school. Yeah, just a comment on that. I want to say my students came away so energized from it and um, I had a number of students actually during parent conferences um, just this week that said after the hackathon my daughter said she wants to go into computer science things along those lines wow, which was great. really cool so um, they just had an amazing time and it just kind of made this additional positivity you know to the whole idea of computer science and CS50 so it's a whole cultural aspect which is great they're already asking if they could have another hackathon this year <laughs> <laughs> so. And when is the right moment to, to make the hackathon? At the middle of the, of the course, at the end of the course, at the beginning? I think both. Not so much the beginning, I would say. I would say puzzle day is what's meant to be at the beginning because <laughs> it assumes no programming experience and involves no programming. Uh, middle has worked well, I think, not only for just fun and excitement, but re-engagement, as Sari spoke to yesterday. Students who might be kind of disengaging they, and wanting something or being um, receptive to something, pulling them back in. And at the end is uh, a sort of strategic strategically optimal because it's final projects and everyone by design then is doing something on their own so you don't necessarily have students um, working on the same challenges so it's all the more of a supportive atmosphere hopefully um, but it both work well I think. And even for the hackathon like even for our students uh, in any case whether you're working more on your piece set or a final project still gave uh, students are more confident in themselves because, oh, so this is like a hackathon. And we hear about these hackathons that companies do and they go around, it's like they are more confident in themselves to go to the real world with their knowledge. <clears throat> that is something that we got. Starting with Arturo, uh, you want to add something? Yeah, that's, that, that was definitely yeah. something that uh, yeah. The, uh, the subject of hackathons leads to another uh, great question we have in here, which is, do students really end up helping one another? Um, Harvard definitely can have a reputation sometimes as being a competitive place. It was a competitive place when I was here. Um, but I think that part of what has made CS50 unique is that it, it does have this cultural aspect where that is not so much a factor anymore. Students really do help one another. As soon as, you know, in, in office hours, you'll see students get together. And as soon as one of them gets it, it's well, have you tried doing this? They, they immediately start to take on a sort of a surrogate teaching fellow role, trying to um, help their, their peers get across the finish line as well. It's very much a, a team, an individual but team effort um, to get everybody to the end of this experience that is intensive and rigorous and can be trying sometimes, but they want as many people to get across the finish line, and we want as many people to get across the finish line. And we really do see a lot of it. And it's really remarkable and inspiring to see in, in small group sections and office hours. Um, it really, it really does happen. And in terms of collaboration and academic honesty, the heuristic to which Doug alluded yesterday has worked well, I think, whereby if Doug is in front of his laptop struggling with something, we encourage students like Doug, ask David to look over at your screen and help you with whatever you're struggling with. But what the line they should not cross is Doug should not solve his problem by looking at my screen. And as he disclaims, you can kind of game that system logically, but the spirit of it is exactly that. Uh, someone else can look at your screen to help you. And that seems to work well. But can they type in your screen? We have no such restrictions on that, um, but... The My kids, when they, when they go to help somebody, they say, here, let me do that. <laughs> yeah. Now you know how to do it. That's why, that's why in, in our case, we, uh, we don't tell them, like, don't do it on the computer. Do it on a piece of paper. Help them on a piece of paper, but don't help them on the keyboard. There's one more thing that I ask them not to do. And I know they, they sometimes do it, but, like, I ask them not to do is that. So don't start helping somebody unless you're done with your piece set because once like I don't want you to uh, see part that you didn't figure out on his screen 
And a part of that you figured out, because once you saw it, you can't take it off from your head. So it's like, I, just explain it, why you're asking them to do that in a way, and they will, they will, they will listen. So not just don't, I more explain why, and they kind of appreciate it later on. And I just want to add, like with the expert system, as we call it in my classroom, um, you know, when the kid finishes, one of the students finishes their problem set, they often will ask to be an expert. They feel proud and excited to be able to share that expertise. And so that kind of gets around the academic honesty problem as well, because they've already finished. So now they're going, able to go around and kind of help other students debug their code. And then the other thing is when I love when they get around a table together and work out the pseudocode together. And so that happens at times as well. So that's the nice way of working collaboratively, but yet maintaining that academic honesty. So that's worked well. And Jack, to get to your question, uh, you go back to that again, your comment. Um, I think that it, when all else fails, I would encourage a hands-off approach because not only can it be counterproductive if the student is typing for somebody else, but also just the act of the student serving in the teacher role explaining the concept also reinforces it. It's, it, it's a two-way benefit. Right, it, incur it reinforces the concept for the student doing the explaining and also perhaps provides an alternative perspective for the student who is on the receiving end of that assistance. And so I would, and generally in office hours when I'm working with students, I keep a very hands-off approach unless it's absolutely necessary. I try not to touch anybody's keyboards um, and just encourage a dialogue back and forth. So the last question before us is, how does the grading workflow work? Uh, which is a perfect segue to a 15 minute break, after which point we'll resume here and actually do some hands-on uh, tinkering. Yeah. One, one more sure. question. Um, could you briefly touch on the difference between office hours and sections? Sure. Office hours are meant to be one-on-one -on -one opportunities for help. We'd gather students in most any room, and we bring a whole bunch of the course's staff there. And when a student has a question, he or she summons us over, catches our eye, and we would go down, lean next to their, their uh, station, and just answer questions that they might have. The, the overarching goal being to unblock them. So they're coming to work and people just walking around? Correct. It's an environment to work on your P-sets, and if and when you have questions, we'll come over and do our best to efficiently unblock you. And in our case, What's commonly the case is students, <laughs> Zamila makes more appearances at office hours virtually than anywhere else. And you see just a sea of her face sometimes as students work their way through the problem sets. And the notion of a walkthrough we mentioned upstairs last night, in addition to Zamila's embedded walkthroughs pre-shot on video, will often, especially if we're overwhelmed, if the teacher-student ratio isn't so great in an office hour setting, we'll factor out as many students as we can. Hey, anyone struggling with Mario.c, come over here. And then we'll have one person at a whiteboard sort of reiterating what Zamila is doing, but offering a slightly different perspective that hopefully resonates more, and that helps siphon off some of the load. Sections, meanwhile, are more traditional classes, um, whereby our lectures are people like me talking to with many students all at once. Sections are meant to be a 1 to 15 uh, teacher-student ratio. So Doug and other members of the staff will commonly lead those smaller scale classes that are much more akin to a medium-sized or small-sized high school classroom um, to reiterate some of the week's material, to go into additional examples, to answer questions and really create an environment that students are more comfortable. And those are planned out ahead of time. You would go into a section with, a, with an agenda. Yes, yeah. exactly. Frequently it gets deviated from, but I have a plan that I yeah. start with. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that's an all too familiar experience. Are those required? Nothing in CSFT is required per se. You're expected, but not required. And how often are you expected? <laughs> Once a week for 90 minutes, and lectures are twice a week for 60 minutes. four times a week for 180 minutes, but purely optional. And I've also gotten some good teaching ideas from the section videos, mm. you know, just because it is kind of a classroom setting, yeah. which is a little bit more of a kind of a traditional type of lesson mm -hmm. that way. So yeah. sometimes just examples or ways of presenting things, it's been helpful to watch those and use those as well. And the, to be clear, the videos have been evolving. What we call sections are just what I described. What we call this year section videos are just dug on camera against a white backdrop, um, playing the role of a proxy for that environment so that the focus is entirely on the online students. So when you see Doug's section, you won't see anyone else, even though in reality there are typically many students in the room. Okay. I just have one more comment. Sure. I don't know how feasible it would be or whatever, but um, maybe Microsoft and Harvard could sponsor some sort of like CS50 you know, event for high school students to take a field trip for the ones that are accessible to you know, Harvard and Cambridge. Um, and that would kind of, you know, enforce the whole sort of prestige of, mm. of Harvard and maybe get them excited about it and, 
I don't know, they could... A hackathon. Yeah, like a hackathon at the beginning of the year or some, or some <laughs> a puzzle day or whatever, get a tour of campus and show, you know, kind of like what we had, you know, and, and I think that would get them to feel like invested and sort of like this special Absolutely. Yeah. So, so you're already cordially invited to the 10th uh, ten, ten and annual CS50 Fair uh, this coming December. Uh, we'll send out the dates for that. Um, we haven't done it with Puzzle Day before, but I like this idea. So we'll probably extend an invitation to Puzzle Day at the start of the semester. Uh, the hackathon, at least we, in our case, we probably wouldn't since it's an overnight thing. And so that opens a can of worms on our end. But the fair and Puzzle Day, I think we, we probably we would. And some of our uh, pilot educators brought their students to the Yale Fair. Yes. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so we can meet you in New Haven or Cambridge now for that and wherever else things spring up. Idea of a high school one. Yeah, just for the high school students. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. So many, if you could, you know, you know? provide a yeah, menu. Yeah, absolutely. How, just show of hands, how many folks in here are within easy driving distance oh, that's to great. Boston Metro? So it's, there's a crew. Okay. Yeah. So we'll see what we can do, much like we did in New York a, a few weeks back. Helpful. All right, so we take our break here and then return for Yes, yeah, so we'll grading. resume at uh, 1030 for a session on how we do grading and assessment in CS50. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.